Blessed New Year, everyone. We are in the, into the first day of 2022. And last December is indeed a very meaningful month for all of us because we have a series of events. We have Christmas, we have baptism, we have the children camp. And also just three days ago, we also have uh, our annual uh, Blessed Run conference. And because we all, for those of us who attended the conference, we know that we have received indeed very intensive messages over the two days. And so in order for us to digest it further, and also for the benefit of those who didn't get to attend the conference, so today this New Year service, we will take this opportunity to recap the important words that God has given us in the last two days conference. So basically what we talk about at the Blessed Run conference is about this uh, being intellectually informed and being spiritually empowered. So what does this mean basically? To put it in simple terms, it just talk about how do we go from knowing into practicing? Or in other words, how can the truth of God extend from our understanding to our lives? So it's very real. So it's about knowing and about having the power to live it out. So first, let's talk about the knowing part. Uh, during the conference, I believe many of us, whether you're on site or whether you listen to the message online, you will hear a lot of things about uh, reform teaching during the conference. So I don't know whether after hearing so much, do you get the gist of what is reform teaching? Now, I mean, reform teaching, if we were to elaborate, it would take multiple sessions. But in gist, Asis Pro once mentioned that the strictest focus of reform theology is on what? is on theology. But what is theology? Theology is on the knowledge. So the knowledge is a key word. So uh, one of the emphasis in the TBR conference is knowing, knowledge. So reform theology, the key point is about knowing God, the knowledge of the true God. And if you think about this statement, it is really true that if a person is not rightly informed about God, then think about, think about it. How can our life be reformed? be transformed if we do not have the right information, if we are not rightly informed. But the thing is, even though we know uh, knowledge is so important, it, when we examine ourselves, when we look at uh, what humans are really interested at, you realise that usually what excites men more? I mean, think about it, what excites you more? Usually, men tend to get, humans tend to get excited about what? About getting the right desired outcome rather than getting the right knowledge. I mean, if we are very honest about, uh, with ourselves, we are usually more interested in getting what we want, the, the things we desire. We don't really care whether the knowledge is right or wrong. We just want to get the thing we want. And so one of the highly desired outcomes that people usually want is what? Is power. But a lot of times, people are also at a loss about exactly how do we get that power that we so much desire. And so I don't know whether you got the answer from the conference. Uh, during the conference, um, Pastor kept saying that, how is the, how, what is the way for us to get true power? And true power tr actually comes from having the right knowledge about God. In fact, we are, we are reminded time and again that it is what? It is dangerous to only want to seek the power of God without truly understanding the truth and the purpose of God. Now, a lot of people, they come to God, they really want to get some power, some energy, some strength from God. But if we only want to get that power without really understanding who God is, what is His purpose, we run the risk of getting into what? A different kind or a wrong power, which is dangerous. And so we are always reminded by the Word of God that this Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that we so desire, this Holy Spirit is not just a powerful spirit, but it is also the spirit of truth. But many a times we see that people, sometimes including ourselves, we are more interested and excited about getting miracles, seeing healings, or getting good outcomes, than we are excited about God's truth. And if that is the case with certain people, you know, if someone is really excited only about those mi miraculous things, then it reflects something wrong with that person's motive. It reflects what that person's heart is truly after. And so we recognize that it is very common for believers, you know, we come to God, we want to draw strength. You just think through your prayers this morning. What is the common or usual thing you ask from God every day, right in the, uh, in the beginning of the day? We tend to ask God to give us the strength. 
so that we can have the power and motivation to pass through the whole day of stress, of tiredness, of the demands required from us. But although power and strength is so critical, we need to realize and re we need to realize one important thing. That is, our heart cannot be empowered blindly in a vacuum. Because if the peace in our heart is not built upon the foundation of real truth, then what kind of peace is that? That is merely a peace we imagine ourselves. Or that is merely a kind of delusional courage that we have if it's not built on real truth, actual truth. And so that's why truth is so important. Uh, a lot of times, people only care about feeling good, you know, care about our heart being right with God. We just want to feel good because God loves us, God is gracious to us, God's uh, favour rests on us. But if a person is not so much concerned about the truth of God, then what happened? That person will run the risk of treating God's holiness, God's commandments, uh, and God's uh, instructions, God's word with contempt. And that person, gradually, he will see lesser and lesser need to obey God. So as a result of this, if we only care about feeling good because of God's love, because of God's grace, the result of it is we may get, into, we may get a wrong idea of the entire gospel, meaning to say we run counter to the very intention of God. Now, when God says He loves us, what do you think is His, is his intention? Uh, God just tells us, oh, I love you, I love you, but what's the point of telling us that He loves us? God meant for His love to stimulate us to be like Him, to be close to Him, to want to draw near to Him, to, to want to please Him. But then the fallen man, in our own interpretation, in our own desire, sometimes we tend to interpret, or rather we prefer to interpret God's love as a way of what? As sort of like a leeway for us to go easy on our sin. Such that even when we sin, we tend to think that, oh, even if we sin, it's not, no big deal because God's love will make him forgive me. And so if we apply God's love wrongly, that wrong application of God's love will actually dull our spiritual senses. It will kill our spiritual conscience. And so we recognize that um, when we get God's intention wrong and when we are not living in the will and the desire of God, you, you tend to realize we get into this paradoxical Christian living where although God's word is living and active and although we are um, receiving God's word, but we just cannot enjoy that power because we are running counter to the very purpose of God. So we see that um, both the heart and the mind, uh, as what we heard during the conference, both the heart and the mind are very important. They are interconnected. So you, we cannot seek to strengthen one without the other. We cannot just seek to strengthen our heart. We want to feel good. We want to feel comforted. We want to feel energized in our heart without going through our mind in terms of understanding God's truth and who God is. So these two are important. And because you just think about it, although we really need the comfort in our heart, but without the promises of God, without what God tells us about what He will do, how can we calm our hearts from all the fears that we have? How can we find the motivation to um, give thanks to God? And also, how do, we, how, how do we bring ourselves to act, to have actions uh, to please God if we do not understand anything about God? And it's just a uh, very airy-fairy kind of peaceful feeling, a uh, feeling of uh, goodness and so on. And so that's why we realize that one important emphasis during the conference is what? Is uh, as what we read just now from Ephesians chapter 1, that we, may, we have to know God better from Ephesians 1 chapter 17. And so when we talk about knowing God, when we talk about the truth, we really need to understand why is truth so important? And the Bible tells us the importance, the reason for the truth being so important. So John chapter 8, here it tells us, to the John chapter 8, uh, verse 31, here it says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So this is one important reason why truth is so important. Because the Bible tells us if we want power, if we want freedom, 
if we, if we want freedom from, uh, from sin, from anxiety, from the world's temptation, if we want freedom, that freedom comes from God's truth. And so uh, we can confirm in our own faith journey. Once, you know, it's once we understand God's truth, meaning to say once you get it, the moment you understood God's truth, the moment God's truth get into our heart and get into our head, what happens at the same time? When you get it, at the same time, you will find the motivation. You will, you will find the motivation to carry out that word. I mean, before we understand uh, what's so wise and what's so good about God's word, it is just a theory to us. We one year in, one year out. We don't, bad, we, we don't bother to live it out. But the moment we realize that this is indeed the truth, no other way, no other way to peace, no other way to hope, no other way to salvation, the moment we get it into our heart and mind that this is the truth, naturally we will find a way to live out and to obey God's truth. And so importantly, we need to know that every time when we say, especially during the conference, when we say we need to be informed intellectually, this being informed in our minds is not simply talking about the what, but it's also talk talking about the why. Why must we obey God? Uh, why must we know the will of God? Now, you just think about which one will motivate you more, knowing the what or knowing the why. A lot of times, knowing the what just gives us this information. Oh, okay, I know, God, you desire holiness. I know there's heaven and there's hell. But just knowing alone does not drive us to live in accordance to, to that. But when we know the why, you know, when we know the consequences, when we know the implication, when we know how it impacts life, when we know the why of the word of God, of the truth of God, then it will drive us to want to live out God's word. And so knowing the truth of God, only that right knowledge will then gradually transform us from what? From our natural state of being rebels to God's truth to lovers of God's truth. Because we will tend to be convinced that God's truth is the way to joy and is the way to satisfaction. And so, God does not really, of course, God wants us to love Him. But how can we move, how can we proceed to love Him? We need to know Him first. I mean, you just think about it. How can you love a God that you don't know? If you don't know that this God, how much He has sacrificed for you, how the extent of His grace, how holy and awesome He is, if a person do not really know God well, how can you bring yourself to love this unfamiliar, unknown, distant God. And so knowing God is very critical to the Christian faith. But yet we know enemies always abound. And so as we live in the world, you will realize that there are many people and many teachings in this world that tries to paint us a very different picture of who God is. Uh, they try to deceive us into a God that the Bible didn't describe. And so they are trying, people of the world, teachings of the world, they always try to replace uh, who God really is, the knowledge about the true God, with what? With a lot of humanistic ideas and belief. And during the conference, we keep hearing the term what? Liber liber liberalism. And so this is something we are called to be very, very careful of, liberalism. And so after hearing so much, this term being repeated, so I mean, now it's a sermon, I cannot test you, but after hearing so much about liberalism, what do you think is liberalism? I mean, it's like a big concept, but in short, liberalism, why is it that we need to, oh, the answer is on the, <laughs> on the slide, okay. The liberalism, why is it so uh, risky and dangerous? It's because it is sort of the opposite from the truth. Liberalism tries to suppress, and it, in fact, when it gets serious, it rejects God's truth. So liberalism, in short, it is what? Now, when we talk about liberal, we know that liberal means being free. And we know that freedom can be good. But although freedom is good, liberalism is not. And why? Because in short, liberalism, as we heard, just means that you know, we are open to any sort of idea, any sort of belief, to the point of not having any real conviction. Or from, uh, uh, from another angle, we are questioning everything. Liber liberals, they question everything, but to the point of not forming any conclusion. So, after, so the thing is, can we question, 
Can we be open to accept and review certain ideas? I mean, of course, God also didn't call us to be very narrow-minded and you know, to be uh, foolish and just accept everything. But what we really need to know is after questioning everything and after acquiring knowledge of the truth, the question we need to ask is, do we then, after questioning, after trying to seek all kinds of knowledge, do we then have a personal and biblical stand? The biblical is important. Biblical and personal stand on various issues. It could be the major issues of life. It could be theological issues. Do we have a personal and biblical stand on that? And I, I don't know, especially for the younger generation here, I don't know whether you also have that perception that when people can question things, they tend to appear smarter. I don't know about... I, I, I mean, I, I feel this generation, there seems to be more skeptics. Or maybe last time there are also, but it's not so obvious. It is true to a certain extent that, you know, when people, they can question a lot of things, they appear to be smarter. Why? Because at least they can think of things to question. They, don't, they are not so simplistic. They don't just accept things blindly. And they are wise enough to, uh, to spot certain loopholes in certain theories. So to a certain extent, they may appear to be quite wise. But then we really need to think deeper. If a person can question a lot of things, can spot loopholes in this theory and that theory, but after considering all sides of the reasoning and argument, if the person still cannot form a conclusion of, on certain matters, then does that mean that the person is truly intellectual? and truly wise. If he only knows how to question, but he doesn't know how to form a conclusion. And so, indeed, in this, uh, living in this world, we want to be very nice and tolerant people. But there's a danger if we accept anything and we refuse to make a clear stand. Why? Because it will just confuse many believers. It will just confuse a lot of Christians. Now, even in the church circle, you know, last time when I went to seminary, there's um, Christians from all different denominations and from different, different churches, and we try to be friendly and tolerant to each other's even theological views. But up to a point, if even Christians, we do not, we want to be nice and tolerant and we don't form a certain political stand, we will end up confusing a lot of Christians, because then they will start, the Christians will start to wonder, then what, can, what is allowed and what is not allowed by the Bible? And when, when people are confused, what is the natural outcome? They start to form their own conclusion. They start to set their own standard. You know, since I asked this pastor, or I asked this cell group leader, they say everything goes, anything can, this one also can, that one also acceptable. Then the individual Christian, they will start to form their own standard. Oh, okay, so by my own assessment, by my own thinking, by my own prayer, I decided whether this is pleasing to God. So there, there is a danger in this kind of situation. And so when we talk about libera liberal, liberalism, one false association is, um, because liberalism, we try to advocate tolerance, acceptance of many, many different ideas. And so indirectly, they are advocating this thing that, you know, we cannot be offensive. Once we are offensive, it means you know, we are wrong. But we really need to be very objective with regard to this kind of thinking. Because you think about it, just when we talk about parent-child relationship, I don't know whether some of you, you can recall when you are in your younger days, you know, when our parents discipline us, does it, sound, does it feel offensive to you back then, you know, when your parents tell you you need to study harder, sleep uh, not so late, uh, and then uh, study, uh, don't play so much, don't be lazy, need to do this, do that. You know, when parents discipline us, at that point in time, because it's against our preference, against our desire, it feels offensive to us also. But we really need to think again and again, is being offensive really always wrong? Because the truth is, we know. What is one characteristic of truth? Truth sometimes hurts, right? But yet, the Bible tells us only the truth can set us free. So yes, because when truth hurts, that means sometimes truth can feel offensive. It may not be palatable to the ear and to the heart, but the truth is what that can, that can set us free from repeated folly and from a lot of delusion. And so God wants us to be free. God wants, us to, give, God wants to give us this power and freedom through the truth. But then we really need to ask, what is the reason why God gives us truth? God gives us truth not just to gratify our desire, to do what we want, to fulfill our agenda, but God gives us freedom so that we can 
be nearer to Him and we can draw down more power from Him. Because God knows, if our freedom leads us to gratify more and more of our flesh, that gratification of the flesh will just lead to death. But when we obey God, it leads to more glory and power. And so all the more, we really need to pray about knowing God correctly. Because only when we know God correctly, then we know what kind of, uh, what will please Him and how we can honour Him and how we can enjoy His power more. So let's take a look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Here it talks about both power and knowledge in this, uh, in this short verse. So verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. So God's power, God will give us power. But what is that power meant, to, meant for? It's meant for us to build a godly life. Through what? Through, not through seeing a lot of miracles, not through trying to practice a lot of spiritual gift, speaking in tongues or whatever, but through, very simply, the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. And through this, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped from escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And so one important thing you read here is through the, our knowledge of Him, we can what? We can be led to a godly life. By what? By not our own power, by His divine power. And so here it tells us the knowledge of God is so important that it will transform our life to a godly one. But a lot of times you realize that in terms of when we talk about knowing God, we are either very distracted or we are not interested to know about God. You know, in the course of pursuing the knowledge of God, sometimes we got distracted by other things. And worse, sometimes when we are honest with our own heart, deep in our heart, in fact, if we are um, honest, we are not so interested to know God compared to knowing things about God. For example, you know, sometimes when we listen to influencer, you know, uh, different kind of influencer, maybe we are just interested in what the influencer had to offer about some beauty tips, about some health tips, but we are not so interested about the influencer's um, life, the character, the life purpose, and so on. Or we are inf interested in the influencer, you know, sometimes the influencer offers tips on how to make money, the, uh, the most money in the shortest a span of time, but we are not so interested about, you know, what is that, the will, what is the char character of that influencer. So likewise towards God. You know, sometimes we thought we are pursuing the knowledge of God, but our heart deceives us. We are actually not so much interested in who God is, what are, what are God's plans, His concern, His will, His attributes, but we are more interested in what? We are more interested on learning how do we tap on the benefits that God can offer to us. We are more interested to know, uh, you know a Christian formula for a successful career, for a blissful marriage, uh, for finding a dating partner, what kind of partner should we find in Christ, or rather than you no, know, we are interested to know God for who He is. And because of this shortfall, because of this um, deviation, a lot of times we seem to know God, but we never get to taste true freedom that we by right should get. From the, from the truth of God. And so there's this missing link. We, we thought we are pursuing the knowledge of God, but we, we are not free. We are not powerful because what we are really pursuing is not the true knowledge of who God is, but we are pursuing knowing how to get the benefits, how to learn some spiritual methods so that we can achieve our own aims. And so we need to be very careful. We need to be very clear. What is it that, what is it that we are pursuing to know? Is it God or something else? And when we say we want to know God, there are two key things concerning knowing God, which were the emphasis in the conference. Of course, God has a lot of attributes. I mean, we cannot, uh, we cannot go through all of, all of God's attributes at one sitting. But two things that was greatly emphasized during the conference were two attributes of God, that God is holy and God is also sovereign. Of course, besides the fact that God is also gracious and God is loving. So first, we look at the first of it. God is holy. A lot of times, if we are sincere in knowing God for who He is, then one thing we must be prepared in our heart is, if we are sincere to know God by His standard, then we cannot know God in a lopsided manner. 
So why, why, do, I say, why do I say lopsided man manner? Because we humans, we always have a preference. And we are very selective toward our pre preference. So what do you think you humans prefer? God's love or God's holiness? I mean, we all heard and we all confirm with our own spirit that we all tend to love God's love better. And so humans, we tend to be lopsided, meaning to say we tend to prefer to know God as the loving Father. And as a result of that, we tend to put lesser emphasis on His holiness. And the thing here is not that Christians do not know that, or it's not that Christians do not agree that God is holy. But the problem is we prefer to think or we tend to think that God's love is greater than His holiness. I mean, I mean, not all Christians are like that, but a significant number of Christians, especially those who embrace a lot of grace teaching kind of Christians, it's not that they do not know that God is holy, but they prefer to think that God's love is greater than His holiness. In what sense greater? In the sense where even if a person is to trample on God's holiness, he will always think that, ah, yeah, even though I trample on God's holiness, I'm not so holy, I sin against God, but God's love will make him overlook that trespass. And in that sense, a person's view of God's love when it's so much higher than God's holiness, it will tend to make the person feel as if God's commandments, God's holiness are what? Optional. They are, they are, you know, if I can do it, I do it. If I can do, it's like, if I can be holy like God is a bonus. If I can obey God's commandment is a bonus. But if I cannot do it, it's no big deal. You know, they tend to have that kind of thinking. And so in and another worse uh, implication that come out from this kind of belief is what? They make God's love turn God into our human servant rather than we are God's servant. Because why? Because they only think about God's attribute as God is love. You know, he don't have his uh, assertion, he don't have his holiness. So those people who think in this way, they will have this impression that God's love make God what? obligated to be nice to us. He needs, he must answer all our prayer requests. He, he must give us all we wanted from him, but he can never demand from us. Why? Because he's loving. He's not supposed to stress us. He's not supposed to be demanding. And so, of course, it's nothing wrong for humans to love grace and love uh, the love of God. But we really need to understand the grace and the love of God in the context of God's holiness. Because only when we can understand the degree of God's holiness, then you can appreciate the degree of how much God actually extends His grace and love to you. I mean, this too is together. If we do not want to know how holy God is, we can never appreciate you know, how, how much it angers God you know, when we sin, but yet, what is the depth of His grace when He forgives us? So if a person never is clear about how holy God is, that person at the same time won't know the true extent and the depth of God's love for him. And so, a lot of times, if we truly know God's, both God's holiness and God's love, then that's the time where, after knowing God's grace, we wouldn't just simply do nothing. Oh, I know God's gracious, I can live my life as I please. But when we know God's grace from the context of God's holiness, then He will prompt us, you know, so you know, you promise to develop and produce this gratitude towards God. That you know, God, even though our our sin provokes your holiness so much, but yet you still forgive us. You are still gracious to us. It provokes us also to respond to God with the willingness to live a holy life, with a willingness to put down our sinful self. And so, one thing important that we never should get out of our mind every time when we think about God is He's not just a loving Father but he's also a holy God. And the second important thing uh, about God that we are always reminded in the conference is what? That God is sovereign. And if you didn't uh, realize it yet, uh, up to now, God's sovereignty is actually at the heart of what? Of this Calvinism that we keep talking about during the conference. Uh, because Calvinists, if, uh, I don't know how many of you really did your homework or maybe some of you already know the difference uh, or the debate between Calvinism and Arminianism. But at the heart of Calvinism is God's sovereignty. Because Calvinists, we have a super or we have a very high view of God's sovereignty. And so from that sense, Calvinists uh, 
very God-centric. On the other hand, as I mentioned just now and as what we heard in the conference, Armenian, Armenians, they are more inclined towards human-centric way. Okay, so uh, it's back to this topic, heavy topic about Calvinists and Armenians. Uh, this is, although uh, I think Pastor also mentioned, some people, we don't like to meddle with this topic because it really opened a can of worm. A lot of reasoning, a lot of uh, debates will come out. But we still need some fundamental understanding. Because we, when we talk about God is being sovereign, you cannot escape from coming into these two, uh, these two uh, critical, critical theories on the sovereignty of God. So, when we talk about um, Armenians, Armenians, in fact, they also started with God's sovereignty. They also started with God's centricity. And that's why if you do your homework about Armenians, you realize that Armenians, they have this thing called prevenient grace. And why do they have this pre prevenient grace? Because even the Armenians, they acknowledge that humans, sinners, we cannot help ourselves. So before man can do anything to please God, God himself must first give humans this prevenient grace to enable humans to come to God. And so from that sense, Armenians are similar to Calvinists in the, uh, at the level where they all or we all can accept total deprivation because there's this acknowledgement that humans, we really cannot. Without the intervention of God, no sinners can respond to God. But the, the, the issue is after that, after that prevenient grace stage, Armenians tend to lean more toward human-centric um, basis. Why? Um, so it's like... In the Armenian belief, it's like God started, the process. God started the process. But in the end, who is the deciding factor? Humans. God started the process by giving everyone the prevenient grace to enable sinners to have the option, to have the ability to accept God. But henceforth, it's up to humans to decide whether you want to take up this option, take up this grace or not. And so, it then, although it sounds reasonable, you know, oh, humans, we don't have the... Uh, capacity and then God enables and the human can decide. Although it sounds reasonable, but what is the key issue? It, the key issue is that such belief make God ends up being helpless at human choices. So it threatens the, the magnitude and the degree of God's sovereignty. And so we know the truth is, what do you think? Is God above humans or human above God? We know that God's power and grace it's so powerful that when God offers His grace and when God offers His power, it's not just an offer. God's power and sovereignty is sufficient to make His offer of grace effectual. So we need to know the difference between what is being offered as in prevenient grace and what is effectual. So Armenians, their idea of prevenient grace sort of imply that, yes, God can offer this prevenient grace to every man, but the efficacy, how effective this grace is, is up to humans to decide. So this is where Calvinists, who have a high view of God's sovereignty, differ from Armenians. And I do understand that, you know, one main, ish one main issue that Armenians, they try to address is, is what? Armenians, they are very afraid of men trying to, humans, trying to absolve ourselves from human responsibility just because God is sovereign. And to be fair to them, is it a legitimate concern? Of course, yes, right? Because uh, a lot, some people, if they misunderstood, if they do not know God correctly, they may just know, oh, God is so sovereign. So therefore, humans have no responsibility. So Armenians, they do have a certain ground in trying to tackle this thing about, you know, humans also have responsibility. But the problem is, in an attempt to dissociate God from sin, the, to try to say that God is not the author of sin, and in trying to dissociate God from, you know, being too harsh in his punishment, they may end up making God smaller, that, than men, because at the end of the day, the determining factor is not God, but is man himself. So this is where, you know, when we think about knowing God correctly and how far, how much do we um, believe in the extent of God's sovereignty, actually we need to, 
we need to struggle with, with our own belief system. I mean, if I ask you, are humans responsible for, for our actions, for our sin? Do we need to pay for our sin? Do we need to be responsible for what we, we do? Yes, of course, the Bible also teaches that. The Bible also says that, you know, God will surely call each other, uh, not each other, call each person to account for what we have done, whether it is good or bad. So it is true. The Bible also says that human, we do, we must have responsibility. But if we attribute equal weight to both human factor and God's fa God factor, then I feel something is wrong. Because how can we make human, um, how can we make human ability the same as God's sovereignty? So, so it's from that perspective, we, we need to rethink again. Because although Ar Arminianism sounds very logical at certain fronts, we also need to really think deeper into the issue. I mean, very honestly, I can share with you. I also have my own struggle before. I mean, it's not saying that, oh, I grew up in this church, I grew up from a Presbyterian background, and, I, and with, uh, with this life church for so all the years that I have no struggle with Calvinism ever. To be very honest with you, my greatest struggle with this uh, Calvinism and Arminianism happens when I was in the seminary because I mentioned to you I have a lot of even good friends good Christian friends they uh, we eat lunch every day and then they were discussing all this thing and they were trying to and some of them they are Arminians, Arminians. and so and of course during the class we also uh, went through all the different arguments and reasoning even scriptures about both the Calvinist Arminians so I, when, I'm, when I started to look at all these things seriously, I do struggle because there are certain things that are hard, hard to accept from the Calvinist five-point kind of thing, right? But as what Pastor mentioned, no matter what, after we are exposed to different uh, reasonings and arguments, even though it's hard to come to a conclusion, we need to pray for God to convince us where we are standing. And so, and, and furthermore, in the seminary, I cannot, I cannot stand on a fence because I need to write paper and submit to my lecturer, you know, and tell them what's my stand. So I remember, I, I, finally, I struggled a lot. I mean, I was thinking, am I a five-point, four-point Calvinist or... But in the end, I still need to submit the paper, right? So I, I wrote, yeah, I, 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 I think I wrote, I'm a five-point, but I'm a moderate Calvinist. But when I say moderate, oh, this is another category. So I don't really like categorization. But when I say I'm a moderate Calvinist, what I mean is I embrace the high view of God's sovereignty. God determines everything, including who is safe, who is not safe. But I'm moderate in the sense I do not just hold on to the high view of God to the extent where I deny human responsibility. I still think that human must be responsible and that's why God judge men. I mean, if humans need not be responsible, there's no need for God to judge anyone because nobody is responsible for anything. But because there is really this danger, some people, they are extreme Calvinists. They have a, such a super high view of God's sovereignty that they cancel out all human, um, human response, human responsibility. And that is a bit too, too far-fetched. But when we look at the Bible, it's very clear, how can a powerful God be unable to do anything about human choices? If it's in accordance to what the Armenians are advocating, they try to solve some problem, but they create more, they try to solve the problem of God is not the author of human sin, God is not cruel to punish people or to didn't save some people, but they create another problem that God is sm smaller than humans. But the thing is, the Bible keeps telling us, you know, Jesus is above all, He is exalted above everything, and God is not helpless. God cannot be made helpless by human behavior. But at the same time, that, again, I mentioned, that does, no matter how sovereign God is, that does not mean that we humans, we have no responsibility to turn away from sin and to strive to live out a godly life. But the point, and the important point here is what? Yes, human, we have responsibility to shun evil, and to pursue a godly living, but even the power to do so, even the power to live a holy life, even the power to resist sin, that power comes from, ultimately, it seems like we are the one doing it. We are the one resisting, resisting sin. We are the one trying to live a holy life, but ultimately, that power comes from God. Because if we are really honest with humans and we know how fallen are the human state, we will recognize that even if someone, a Christian, is born again, 
we are still very fallen. We are still very much attracted to sin. And it's still very difficult for us to do good. Just as the great Apostle Paul, he himself, his profession, who, which of us we are uh, more spiritual and holy than Apostle Paul? I don't think any one of us dare to say we are holier than Apostle Paul. But even Apostle Paul, he said what? The good that I desire to, to do, I cannot do it myself. So who can save me? Only God. So in the same way, if, uh, if man becomes the deciding factor of, in the end, you know, whether we are safe or not, if man, um, yes, we are responsible, but if we do not have the power of God, we won't be able to do anything, even if we want to. And so it is important to know human, again, I said human, we have the responsibility, but the power comes from God. And when God's empowerment comes upon us, we have no excuse to say we won't want to do it or we cannot do it because when God's power comes upon believers through the help of the Holy Spirit, we cannot say, you know, oh God, you know, I, I cannot lead a godly life because God is helping us along the way. And that leads me to the second section of today's sermon about power. So our God, as I mentioned, He's sovereign and He's powerful and He certainly will empower His people, His children. And that's why God gave us his truth. You know, some people say, wow, God, you're empowering me. How? Do I have special search of power from the Holy Spirit just after prayer or just uh, when I wake up suddenly? God gave us power through what? Through his truth. So just now, first point, we already understood that truth is very important. But we need to understand why is truth important and what is the purpose of truth. So we need to understand when we say that God's truth is important, purpose of God's truth is what? God's word is meant, is designed to change our heart and transform our life. From that sense, it is powerful. So, so just now we read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, right? The divine power of God can give us everything we need to live a godly life. Now, to live our godly life, do you need power? Surely we need power. So the truth of God, and that power comes from what? comes from the knowledge of God who called us. So we need to be very clear. God's truth is not just meant for our information. You know, sometimes when you read newspaper, newspaper is for our information. The infection rate is how much, uh, what, what is the current variant. All these are for information. But God's truth, is the, the intention of God's truth is not just for information. But that information should lead us and it aims to lead us to a response whether it, it leads us to our action, our faith, or our decision. So, so to be clear, God's, the knowledge of God is meant to transform into practical power in our living. But the, the issue is one. The issue with a lot of Christians is, yes, we know God's truth is supposed to transform our life, but the transformation didn't come. So what's the problem here? The problem is, after learning the life-giving truth of God, we didn't depend on that power of the truth. Rather, we depend on what? We rather depend on worldly knowledge instead of the biblical knowledge. So, you know, sometimes we just say, you know, God, this doesn't sound real. You know, your word is supposed to bring forth power in my life. But I didn't taste that power. But before we accuse God, we need to reflect. Are we using God's word? Are we depending on God's word in our daily life? Or are we depending on something else? So if uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, basis, if we rather depend on human wits than God's wisdom, if we rather trust human methods, or rather a lot of people say Google than God's wisdom, then how can we honestly and possibly see God's power being exercised in our life? And the truth is, if the, the lesser we apply God's word and the lesser we apply God's power in our life, then the lesser we will be convinced that God is powerful. And you'll start to think that you are only bluffing yourself that God is powerful and this Christian theory just sounds very nice, but it doesn't work. But I mentioned just now, in fact, it is not because God is not powerful, but it's because we didn't use that power. So end up, we didn't enjoy, we didn't experience that power so well, so much. 
you know, as I'm trying to think of an, an analogy, I just think of the washing machine analogy. You know, the washing machine is very powerful with all the function. You know, nowadays, it's very modern te technology. And certain washing machine can even claim, you know, wow, with this modern latest te technology, it can be as clean as hand wash laundry. But if a person very stubborn, trust in the hand more, want to exert his own effort and strength to wash the clothes and thinking hand wash clothes, I mean, this is controversial, but I mean, just imagine. And then try to use all his own strength to wash the clothes. They're very tired at the end of the day. And then it's not because the washing machine is not powerful. It's just because you don't depend on that power. You don't depend on the available source, but you try to depend on, your, on yourself. In the end, you don't feel that washing machine is powerful. In the same similar way, I mean, of course, God is not just a washing machine, but in a similar way, God is all ready, you know, to, to, to equip us with all the wisdom, all the strength that we need. But we don't want to use that. We say, God, it's okay, you can rest. You know, God, I can trust my own eloquence. I can trust my own experience. I can consult my experts. I can consult the doctor and the Google. God, I don't really need you. And as a result of not using God, not going to God, not trusting God as a default mode, of course, naturally, our experience of God is, I don't think God, you're that powerful. I don't think God, you're that fantastic. In fact, this is just all talk, but it's not real. So before we accuse that God is not powerful enough, we need to ask, have we relied on God consciously enough? Or in other words, are we more biblical? Or are we more pragmatic? Do we trust the Bible more? Or do we trust what works more, our life experiences more? And so, just like I mentioned, we need to understand that when God, he, He's really prepared to give us power. But God is giving us power to serve His purpose, not serve our own end. And so specifically, when we live in this sinful, fallen world, we need to pray for God's power to withstand two things. And that's what we heard during the um, conference. We need, to, we need power to resist persecution, I mean, to withstand persecution and also seduction in this world. You know, one oppresses us, the other deceives us. Persecution oppresses us and seduction deceives us. So we need power for both these things. And living in this uh, world where, you know, this is a secular world with an increasing, what, advocacy for tolerance. So it's getting harder and harder to declare our Christian position and to assert some of our Christian belief. And so indeed, we need power to face that kind of tension. And so God is not hiding the truth from us. If we want to be a godly Christian, God already, already told us that in this world, godly Christian will surely face persecution. But God also promised that in trials, we can emerge stronger in our faith and relationship with God. And so when it comes to finding the right power, one thing, that, one thing needs to get into our head, and that is power is not a magical power. It's not like a superstitious power that suddenly comes upon us. So we must not expect you know, that a sudden surge of power will suddenly come upon us one day. But how does power come? Power comes upon us when we step by step obey God. When we one matter by one matter, one matter by one matter, we bring to God. We seek His will and we try to submit to Him. And so, as we try to submit and obey God step by step, matter by matter, our hearts will be convinced that, you know, as God let things unfold, as God uh, let us see how um, he, le he led us as we go to Him, our heart will be more and more convinced that, yes, it is indeed right and wise to do as God say. And as we step by step obey God, God will also show us how we can gain more and more foothold against the evil one. And so we talk a lot about obedience uh, last two days. And usually when people think about obeying God, we will think of the arrow in the opposite direction. We will think what must come first. For us to obey God, you know, we need power from God. Yes, it's true. I, I mean, I mentioned just now, uh, even the will, even the uh, power to obey God must come from His empowerment first. But the, the, the arrow in the opposite direction is also true, meaning to say, when we obey God, that is also a channel for us to enjoy more of God's power. I mean, why do I say so? I mean, if uh, this one, of course, I think in our faith journey with God is what you can confirm for yourself. 
you know, as we align ourselves with God, what is the natural outcome? When you align your heart, when you align your prayer, when you align your um, ways of living with God, it will naturally what? please God. And when God is pleased, He will gladly bestow more power upon us so that we can use His power to witness for Him and to carry out His mission. But on the other hand, if we do not obey God, I mean, God is not a foolish God. Although He's a loving God, He's not a foolish God. If we are not obeying God, why should God demonstrate His power on us? You know, when we are not trying to do His will. Why should God exercise His power to bless us if we are in defiance toward Him? I mean, of course, as I mentioned before in earlier sermon, when we are not obedient to God, God can show us His power also. But that power is to discipline us, not to bless us. So I remember, I remember during the conference, I heard this, that yes, God is powerful, but we must know that God does not use His power anyhow. There's a basis to trigger God's power to be unleashed in a, in a blessed way. So God can use His power any way He likes, but He doesn't do it anyhow. And what is, the, what is the way for us to enjoy God's power flowing through our life is when we are prepared to obey God. And so, even in cases where you find it so hard to obey, even when in cases where you feel like within our ability it's so hard to obey the call of God, if we still obey first, that is the moment, that is the occasion for us to be surprised by God's power. Uh, I don't know whether some of you, you all still remember events sharing at TBR conference. Uh, you know, at, she says she has this very busy work and then she has this children camp. It's impossible to do anything. I mean, it's impossible to finish the work and also run the children camp. But she still, what? Submit first. Then after that, God's power flow through. And God's power uh, is evident in her life that she can settle the work and she also can have a very blessed children camp. So the thing about obedience leading to God's power coming all the more upon us is really this. When we are challenged beyond our limit, when we see that it's impossible for us to obey God because we are still of the flesh, our faith is still little, our time is still limited, and we are very tired. But nonetheless, if we still obey first, you will see how when we submit to God's calling, after that, how, God's, how God adds power to us, how God helps us do things that surpass our own limitation. And so this is uh, one thing we need to pray about. Yes, in the course of obeying God, Will we have struggle? Yes, we will surely have struggle. I mean, if I mean, none of us we are hundred percent sins. So, we, when there's flesh and when there's sinful nature and when there's limitation, when we whenever we want to submit to God, there's bound to be struggle. But the thing is, even though we may struggle, we can still resolve to obey. Now, this is a prayer topic for all of us. Even though we struggle, it is true. Everyone will struggle. But despite struggling, we can still resolve to obey God first. And so, how do we, so the, the question is, then how do we get the right power? How do we guard ourselves? How do we move along the direction to, to really enjoy the power from God? We receive certain direction from the conference. Uh, I don't know whether you all still, for those of you who attended, I don't know whether you still remember Pastor mentioned this thing called faith over general sentiments. Uh, just now I talk about persecution. We need power against persecution. But in this day of our modern society, you know, we won't get very brutal kind of persecution, like people won't throw you into jail, I mean, not in Singapore, or whip you like last time uh, in the Roman Empire. But oppression may not come in the form of literal life and death threats, but it comes from what? Mass pressure. Because tolerance is so much advocated in this society. Now, if you think about it, if even the government, government have authority, right? They are treading very carefully, even on public sentiments. I mean, even for Singapore, we are already not like the Western country. They are so open, you know, but we have certain, uh, is, uh, government have quite a high power. But even so, they tread very carefully on public sentiment. So not to mention for us, we are just ordinary people. So it's indeed um, hard. There's, there's indeed certain tension when we want to assert our Christian stand because the, the, the temptation to conform to the masses is very high because if we do not conform, 
we tend to feel that our relationship with people, our, even our jobs may be jeopardized. So there is this high temptation to, to, to conform to the world. But when we pray to God, we need to struggle till we can trust that God is more powerful than the power of the masses. And when we come to that acknowledgement of God's higher power, I mean God's greater power than the masses, then we will be able to uh, stand our ground even if the world does not understand, even if the world does not support us. And so we must really understand that, just now I mentioned, although God gives us power, God's power comes more and more, as we struggle through, as we battle with our sin, with the world, with the devil's temptation. And an obedient Christian will surely struggle through, through what? Struggle till we are able to surrender to God more than to the pressure of the world. And you realize that even though we all don't like to struggle, but indeed strength comes from more and more consistent struggling because as you struggle more with your sinful nature as you struggle more with the world's pressure actually we grow our spiritual muscle such that we get less and le less fearful of the public opinion we get less and less um, uh, tempted by our sinful nature and so on and so in this sinful world other than resisting this persecution from the stress of the masses, we also need to pray against the urge to be what? Double-minded. Because uh, what is, when I say double-minded, what does it mean? Double-mindedness is the state of wanting God and something else. I want God. I also want my many, many idol, idols. So when we want to get power and enjoy the power from God, we really need to resist our idolatrous tendency so that we don't fall easily into seduction. Uh, so as we examine ourselves, and especially for those of us who tend to think that, oh, I've known God for a long time, but yet I still cannot enjoy as much spiritual power as I imagine, then we really need to think, are there tendencies in us that make us yearn for an easy shortcut to success or uh, make us yearn excessively for material possession or make us yearn excessively for um, the need to be recognized by people? Is there a subtle pride in us that we want to um, be recognized and honored in the presence of men? I mean, all these are double-mindedness. All these are idols that draw power away from us. Because when all this double-mindedness come, the Bible tells us, you know, you do not, the double-minded should not think that they will get anything. Because... They want God, they want the world, they want God, they want money. In the end, they cannot enjoy the full extent of God's power. So one thing we need to pray when we want to pursue power, the right power is, even though, just like I say, we need, to, we need to have power against seduction. It is true that everyone will be tempted by the devil. But even so, at least we need to pray that what? At least we must pray that we shall not be an easy prey of the devil. I mean, it is true. I mean, whether you are a very fervent Christian, very solid Christian, you will also be tempted. Even Jesus is tempted. So we must not feel discouraged that, you know, after multiple prayer, why did God still allow me to be tempted? You know, God, I tried so hard to stick to you. Why do you allow things to tempt me? Why do you allow things to distract me? And sometimes when all this distraction and temptation come, we just, we just feel discouraged. But I say again, even though all of us will be tempted by the devil, at least pray that we make it hard by the help of God for the devil to take us down. You know, at least we put up a good fight. At least we pray that by the help of the, of the Holy Spirit, even if the devil wants to deceive us, he will not have an easy job to do. At least pray that we will not be so easy for the devil to, con to devour. So do not give the excuse, you know, you know, anyone will face temptation and so you don't want to fight. If we become so passive, we are like digging our own grave and we are just waiting to fall. And so we need power to resist uh, and withstand persecution and seduction. But besides just resisting sin and, and temptation, we also need to pursue to be godly because the Bible tells us what? With godliness also comes power. I mean, if we resist sin, if we resist temptation, we are only like back to the neutral state. You know, neutral state, no plus, no minus, neutral state, if we resist sin. But when we pursue godliness, we, have the, we can enjoy the power 
that comes with godliness. I mean, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, those, there are a group of people who seem to have a form of godliness, but denying the power of godliness. That implies what? For the group of true godly people, true godliness will come with power. False godliness deny power, don't have power. But true godliness will come with power. And so if we want to be spiritually empowered, we need to pray that God do not just let us hate sin. Let us love holiness. Let us love and enjoy a godly living. And for us to really plunge and launch into a godly living, it's very important for us to purge anything that stands in the way. So what are the things that stands in the way of godly living? All the carnal preoccupation, you know, our idols, our sin. And for us to purge out all this uh, carnal preoccupation, uh, we heard in the conference, there are a few things we can uh, work at, we can pray about, about having the true repentance, about immersing ourselves in the Word of God, in prayer, and to put ourselves in blessed environment. I mean, of course, all this I won't repeat. You can, you can go and uh, listen again. But if we really want to be godly, and we know that there are forces inside and outside us that's trying to pull us away from this godly living, how can we do without prayer? How can we not be inspired by the Word of God every day? How can we not put ourselves in a blessed environment to safeguard our heart and mind every week? So these are very practical things. It's just that if you want to function, if you want to uh, live in this world, you need to eat your breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. So if we really want, and if we are really serious about living a godly life, how can we say, oh, I read God's Word once in a while, you know, uh, as and when I like it? How can we say that I only pray during emergency situation? How can, how can we say we only come to church when it's not raining? But today it's raining, a lot of people are coming. So how can we say that we only come to church or only when I am convenient? So these are the things that we really need to be practical. If we want practical, so the thing goes both ways. We always want practical help from God, practical power from God. But we are not practical in the way we respond to God. So it doesn't gel, you see. Uh, we, we, we say, God, I want to have day-to-day uh, -day energy power from you. But we don't consult him day-to-day. -day. We don't even pray to him every, every, every day. So how can we enjoy that daily practical power? And so, again, when we talk about being godly, and of course there will be moments where we fail, when we fail in living out that godly way and we get into repentance, God wants us not just to repent from specific sins, but God wants us to pray about an overhaul in the transformation of our life, in our nature. Meaning, yes, we can confess our specific sin and ask for God's forgiveness, but at the root of it, every time when we come before God to repent, we really need to ask God to crush ourselves, which is so powerful, and help us yield ourselves to God, rather than always seeking our own desire than God's kingdom. So we... So what the kind of uh, repentance that God really desires is the kind of repentance that asks God to turn ourselves to Him. Ask God to uh, crush our flesh so that we can yield to the Holy Spirit. This is the kind of power that, uh, this is the kind of prayer that God desires from us. And of course, God also knows, is it easy for us to turn from a fallen life and suddenly get into a godly living? Of course, it's not easy. And that's why God helped us. But, of course, when we hear God help us, we will think, oh, God help us by the power of the Holy Spirit. God help us by comforting us, etc. But God also help us in a way that we may not like it so much. And that is, God help us by giving us tests and trials. Yes, God knows it's so difficult to get into a godly living. It's so difficult to put down ourselves and surrender to Him. It's so difficult to give up the pleasures of the world and turn our eyes on the unseen spiritual rewards instead. It's so, it's so difficult, it's so anti-human nature. And that's why God needs to help us. And that's why we also need trials and tests. Because when we are honest, we know that trials and tests often, often breaks us down. As much as we do not like to go through trials, but the truth of the matter is trials have the effect of breaking us down, breaking us, breaking our false pride, not false, the pride is real, uh, breaking our pride down because we tend to trust ourselves. 
and also breaking down our false hope. Because a lot of time we hope in ourselves. We have hope in humans, but we don't trust God. And a lot of times we really need this tests and trials to awaken us from our delusion because otherwise we have a lot of delusion we have a lot of delusion about ourselves we have a lot of delusion about how much the world has to offer how much people can help us only by trials and tests that god can bring us out from all this delusion and surrender us to solely hope in him and so god help us through tests and trials so don't be dis discouraged every time we go through that because god loves us and with this trial we will taste his faithful power. And lastly, finally, to enjoy the power of God, the power of God comes when we witness for Christ. Because as we read just now, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you know, when we receive the Holy Spirit, well, we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. To do what? To enjoy ourselves? To have an easy life? No, to witness for God to the ends of the world. So God gave us power so that we can spread his gospel. God also knows. If he didn't empower us, where shall we find the joy? Where shall we find the words? Where shall we find the testimonies to bring people to his gospel? So when we seek power to do his will, God will surely give it to us. I mean, if we ask God for power to do other things that we, we ourselves want, we will not be sure whether God will or not give us. But when we ask for power to do his will, God has no reason not to grant us. So in conclusion, we talk about power, we talk about knowledge. So if we really want to live an empowered life, we must seek the power from the right source and in the right way through the knowledge of God. And so our power must be built upon the foundation of God's never-failing truth. Otherwise, if it's not built on God's truth, that power is just an empty power. No matter how great you feel now, that power, if it's not founded on the Word of God, it is just a false kind of power, delusional kind of power. And so the Bible points us to the source of power. What is that source of power? Through a correct knowledge of God and His Word. And so if we live and we, if we seek God's truth and obey God's truth in every domain of our life, then we can be prepared that we can see God's power displayed in every aspect of our life. So our final prayer is that God help us find and receive the right knowledge and the right power. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that we are now into this new year and we started this new year with the reminder that we need the right knowledge of you so that we can enjoy the right power from you throughout the, the, new, the new year. So Lord, we thank you for giving us this message um, at the recent TBR conference. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit continue to help us desire to know you and continue to help us confirm that when we know you right, our life can be rightly reformed, transformed, and not only we ourselves will be blessed, but everyone who are in contact with us, they will also be blessed through our life testimony and the gospel we share. So Lord, I pray that um, you continue to make us hunger and thirst for your truth, and you continue to let your truth be lived, be lived out through our lives. And I pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.